Okay, welcome to Alternative Fuels 2 video. Um, we left off with coal with the last um, the last video, and so we are moving on now to propane, which you commonly know as LPG. Okay, liquid petroleum gas. And the uh, positives of this um, alternative fuel are that it's a byproduct of natural gas processing and crude oil refining, and so uh, it's uh, something that we are already producing that used to be burned off um, but now is compressed and uh, into a liquid state and then transported so it has to be um, that is one of it, its issues is that it needs to be uh, transported under pressure uh, it's widely available at service stations for cooking and heating uh, this is what you put into your barbecue these are the, um, uh, the bottles that you fill for your barbecue the cars can be cars can be easily converted to running on LPG, um, and they, it produces fewer emissions than gasoline. And we'll talk about it in class a little bit. But carbon uh, or propane compared to gasoline is uh, a shorter has fewer um, carbons in its chain. It's a smaller molecule and therefore burns more efficiently than gasoline. I will go over that in class. Okay, negatives, it's non-renewable, and its production creates methane. All right, we can use methane as a, uh, as a fuel source as well, um, that is a, but it's a greenhouse gas that's 21 times worse for global warming than CO2. And the reason that we say it's 21 times worse is because it captures heat at a greater rate than carbon dioxide. Much greater rate, it captures heat and keeps it, stores it in the atmosphere. Now, uh, it will eventually be broken down if it's in the atmosphere because um, uh, bacteria can use it, some bacteria can use it as an energy source, as a food, and they break it down into carbon dioxide. But in the meantime, if it's um, at a higher level in the, in the atmosphere, then um, we wind up with a uh, uh, greater rate of warming. Okay, so the next one we'll talk, we'll, that'll seg well into um, talking about methane. All right, we can use methane for a fuel source. And this methane or gas hydrates is really an interesting um, possible potential alternative fuel. Okay, so because methane is um, gaseous, and it is the product of um, breakdown of organic materials by bacteria. And you will be very familiar with methane because when you eat something like a raw onion, there are bacteria in your guts that will produce methane. And uh, I think we all know where that comes out. So um, methane is produced in places uh, in the in the deep ocean, well, it's produced anywhere where you're going to have um, uh, breakdown of of um, materials, especially in anaerobic conditions. So in sediments, if you've got so if you've got a whole lot of uh, organic snow falling down to the down to the ocean floor and it gets buried and you've got an anoxic condition, then you have breakdown by these um, uh, anaerobic bacteria and they create methane. But if you're in the in special conditions where you're in the tundra or you're in uh, deeper water, sort of in the, uh, I think it is in the 500 meter to 5,000 meter range, uh, depending on where you are, then you wind up with um, uh, ice, molecule, ice crystals forming around the bubbles, okay, the bubbles of methane that are being produced by these bacteria. And so these things are fairly stable. It's just, it's a layer of ice that's in the sediment, and the ice is filled with bubbles of methane. Okay, so here's a picture of what um, um, gas hydrates or um, this slurry of methane um, will look like. Okay, and so if you pull up a sediment, here's a um, 
uh, something from a sediment core, these chunks of ice. You can see it's sort of an icy chunk here being held, and you pull up the core, you can actually light it on fire, and it'll burn. So, um, there's t considered to be two times the amount of carbon bound in um, methane gas hydrates as there is in all other known fossil fuels on Earth. So, the remaining reserves of fossil fuels... Um, Okay, so if we think about the uh, remaining reserves of fossil fuels, we were talking about we burned about half of them, all right? Not including coal, sorry, that's petroleum. But um, including coal and all of the uh, oil that we've all that we've ever burned, um, the amount of carbon stored in the methane hydrates at the seafloor uh, in gigatons far exceeds that in oil, gas, and coal. So uh, more than, uh, there's a whole lot of energy uh, to be exploited if we can um, learn how to, how, to, uh, um, how to mine this stuff. Now, of course, it's very deep water or in the tundra. So here's your coal, carbon, and gigatons. To, and carbon really is, is a source when we're talking about fossil fuels. So carbon-based uh, fuels like coal, oil, gas, this is um, uh, remaining reserves, this is gas hydrates. So if we, if we start utilizing this, we've got lots and lots of, of, of cheap energy, maybe cheap. Problems are that nobody's really figured out how to capture it yet. Uh, although there are trials uh, underway in the tundra and in an offshore area of Japan okay um, and but the problem is if you start digging this stuff up you start mining it you could destabilize the sediments and then if you wind up with landslides you get massive tsunamis alright so if you dig a whole lot out of the the um, continental slope the shelf slope which is where these things tend to form then you could be um, just like we saw with uh, mining you could be causing uh, massive underwater landslides which could cause tsunamis and of course uh, since it's a fossil fuel and when you burn it you create CO2 then you get um, a greenhouse gas as a byproduct so even if we can um, if we can access this um, energy source this alternative fuel there's a question of whether we should and but the the thing is, it, it's an interesting one because the corollary is that it's possibly going to uh, contribute greatly to global warming anyway if the oceans warm up. So if the oceans warm up and start to um, warm up some of the sediments by even a small amount, enough to um, to release or to melt ice in the tundra or in um, uh, at us at the the upper depths where this stuff is found. There could be huge amounts of methane released anyway, uh, and that will um, accelerate global warming. And there's fossil evidence that this has happened at times throughout Earth's history, uh, coupled with large seafloor extinctions. So Japan's experiment so far has taken 10 years and $700 million to produce 4 million cubic feet of gas, which is worth about $16,000 today at U.S. gas prices. Uh, or fifty thousand dollars at today's price U.S. for uh, imported LNG in Japan, liquid natural gas. So um, seven hundred million to produce sixteen thousand dollars worth. So at this point, it is not economically viable, but it, it may be something that's inter that's used in the future. Okay, hydroelectric, and we've got um, this uh, YouTube video that will have a look at in class. It shows the schematics of how hydroelectric, uh, hydroelectric per turns turbines. So um, essentially with this one you just dam up a river and you s take the potential energy that's stored in this water being at this elevation and as it runs down it turns into um, mechanical energy 
and that powers uh, turbines. So as it falls down, it um, re the energy is is released or is uh, transformed from the falling energy of the water into mechanical energy. Okay, so if we look at New Zealand power generation by type, the geo the uh, hydro is the greatest portion of our electrical supply in New Zealand. All right. Any problems with uh, with um, hydroelectric? Well, um, we've lost a lot of uh, rapids and natural features. There's a uh, a big um, stouch going on right now in the um, in the west of the uh, South Island, and um, they want to uh, put a hydroelectric um, dam, which will flood a um, a valley. Because uh, where you have the steepest areas of uh, of fall in your rivers, that's where you're going to get the most electricity generation because you're, uh, you're going to get the most potential energy by um, the water falling quickly. All right, so um, we have, and when you flood a uh, uh, when you build a dam, you're going to flood an area, and that area may be significant of significant ecological value. All right, so but uh, that's. Uh, Hydroelectric, okay. There is another type of hydroelectric, though, that you can you have tidal power. So tidal power could be the most reliable source of energy on the planet. Tides are totally predictable. We can we know from um, quite a long time in the future uh, where uh, uh, we can tell a hundred years from now what the as long as the moon orbit doesn't change when the high tide's going to be in the Tarrant Harbor and exactly how high it's going to be uh, with a slight variation from um, weather systems. Okay, so there are two ways that you can um, you can uh, get power out of uh, extract some of the potential energy out of tidal movements. The first method is just to put in a dam to construct the flow across turbines uh, similar to a conventional dam. So you've got a river or estuary channel with the tidal flow, and then you put in a dam, and when the water's going in with the tide, then it turns your turbines one direction, and then when it comes back out the other way, when the tide is falling, then the um, it turns the turbines the other way. But as long as you're turning the turbines, you're going to create power. And here is a... Uh, an example. This is the largest one in the world, the Rance River Tidal Barrage in Bretagne, France, and this is a place very similar to uh, the Bay of Fundy. Um, not quite as high a tides as Bay of Fundy, but they'll get uh, eight meter change in their in their tides. So there's a massive amount of water moving uh, in and out of this in this area. And if you're interested, I can explain uh, how geology can um, can change the uh, the yeah the geo geolo geological features of that area can change how tides heights uh, are expressed in certain areas but anyway um that would be a uh, in class or for another time but you can they they uh, create a peak of 240 megawatts when the um, tidal flow is at its highest. Of course, there's no energy produced when the tide isn't moving. Uh, that's an uh, uh, average of 62 megawatts. So they're getting quite a bit of energy at times uh, and uh, less energy at other times, but it averages at 62 megawatts, so, which is a fair amount of production. Okay, so um, of course there are going to be environmental effects, and um, you will find that um, upstream of this, it slowed the water down. Uh, the tide, the water's not racing in and out as quickly because of this dam. Um, and so there's been a bit of siltation that's happened upstream of the uh, of the d of the the dam. And sand deals in place have, uh, which are a flatfish like a flounder, have pretty much disappeared due to that siltation. But sea bass and cuttlefish have reappeared. So. Uh, winners and losers in any, any kind of alteration of the uh, environment. Okay, and you can still um, navigate this with a system of locks that they've built on the side.
probably possibly even in a safer in a safer manner I don't know okay and the other way of um, har harvesting uh, tidal energy is to put turbines in areas with high tidal flow so you can anchor something like this to the sea bottom and as the this is very much like a wind generator as the um, uh, the tide flows one direction it'll turn the turbine or it'll turn this fan one way and when it flows back the other direction it'll flow it'll um, uh, turn the turbine another direction All right. and here's an interesting video that uh, shows you something uh, uh, a quite an interesting uh, theoretical way to uh, increase uh, generation of power from tides. We'll have a look at that in class as well. All right, we're going to pause here and go before the, um, uh, and we're going to talk about geothermal on video three for alternative fuels.